Hi class, welcome back. It's nice to talk to you again. Um, I hope you guys all enjoyed the first show, and this is your Unit 2 lecture, so welcome to Terror, given circums terror in Given Circumstances. In the last lecture, we talked about Aristotle's six elements, plot, character, theme, rhythm, language, and spectacle. We also talked briefly about empathy as an element, and in your assignments, you all came up with another element on your own. We're going to continue down this path that we started in this lecture. We're going to be talking about another non-traditional element, terror. And then we're going to also talk about the foundation of a script, given circumstances. One of the goals of the perfect recipe exercise that you completed after seeing the show was to get you to start thinking of a play as a recipe for a performance. The play includes all the ingredients and directions for how to put them together to create a piece of theater. A director and actor is just like a chef, then uses the script or recipe to create a show. And just like cooking, with every single performance is going to be different. No two chefs make the same recipe the exact same way. Uh, sometimes they throw in something extra in or leave something out. Some sometimes a dish tastes wonderful, and the next time they make it, it just doesn't work. Uh, the same is true with plays. As we continue to talk about the different elements that make up a play, I want us to keep this idea of a recipe in mind when we go see shows to remember that one of the joys of theater that every performance of a production is going to be different. Now before moving on, we're going to discuss another element of drama, terror. And you should have already read the Anne Bogart article on terror that is posted. If you haven't done so, you should stop and read the article before you continue on with this lecture. Seriously, if you haven't read it, everything that I'm going to talk about is not going to make sense to you. Um, and it's only six pages and full of insights. So if you haven't read it, stop this recording now and go back and read that article and then just jump back to where we are. Anne Bogart is considered one of the most uh, highly regarded, respected American directors over the last couple decades. Her work with City Company and Viewpoints, which is an acting and theater devising technique, has literally changed the way that work is made in this country. In the article, she discusses terror, disorientation, and difficulty. The reason I think it's important for us to understand and study this idea of terror as an element of theater is that when we see plays, often they will be disturbing, difficult, and confusing. Um, in an effort to become better audience members, we need to learn how to approach those works or moments that are difficult and confusing. You know, what do we do when we're seeing a show and we just don't get it or it just doesn't work for us? Bogart talks about the first few shows or plays that she ever saw as a child and how they were often disturbing, difficult, and terrifying. She realized quickly that her experience of theater was not about understanding the meaning of a play or even the significance of the staging, that the world she was experiencing on the stage was completely unique and undefinable. An arena that changed everything previously defined, she says. She talks about how as humans, um, our truly remarkable experiences, the ones that really change us are filled with uncertainty and difficulty. When we are born, we come into a world that is terrifying and trembling. Everything and every experience we have is completely undefined and new. We don't know what anything is, is at first, you know, when we're first born. The entire world is a big mystery. And then as we grow older and begin to understand how the world works, we begin to define things. That strange wooden thing over there is a chair and those giant monsters in the sky are clouds. The mystery of life slowly vanishes. For Bogart, the purpose of art, the purpose of theater is to return to us, the audience, back to that state of unknowing, back to this, that state of mystery. So when we go see a show and you're lost, you're confused, um, I ask simply that you not tune out, that you not start thinking about you know, what are you going to do after the show or have for dinner, um, but, that you, but that, that you take that moment to really lean forward and engage more because, it, because it's in these moments of unknowing um, that can lead us to new revelations, to new ideas we've never thought about before. What we know um, is boring. You know, what is new, confusing, and different is full of excitement and possibility. We often like to see plays that are easy and comfortable because they reinforce what we already know. Um, 
film does that a lot. You know, we pick movies a lot of times or, or we see sequels because we know what we're getting ourselves into. And I really want us to start to begin to start thinking about how and longing for these moments of difficulty, these moments that are really hard and confusing. Uh, because when we go out of our comfort zone, it can be terrifying. Um, but because it's different and unknown, it's undefined. But that's really where I just want to stress to you, I think that the real money is. The knowledge that we lack, the feelings that we haven't experienced before. Uh, and for me and for Bogart, that's where, really where the real joy um, in this art form lies. And things that are confusing and unknown to us. Things that are new and undefined. Okay, so at this point we've discussed eight different elements of drama. Um, including some other ones that you guys in your papers, uh, new elements that you brought up that make up theater. And of course, uh, we could go on talking about dozens more uh, of these building blocks. But, you know, I think we have enough of our blocks, plot, theme, rhythm, spectacle, character, language, empathy, uh, terror now, to start talking about how a play or a script is built. You know, how do we take these blocks, um, like these, these builders here with their cinder blocks, and start creating a play? or a piece of theater, you know, where to begin? What is the foundation of a play script? And to do that, we're gonna start by talking about given circumstances. The given circumstances resemble the base of a building, uh, the foundation upon which everything is built. Uh, the term given circumstances uh, concerns all the materials in a script that delineates the environment or creates uh, the special world of the play that Bogart spoke about. Uh, we're going to talk about three aspects of the given circumstances or the foundation of the script. First, the environmental facts, um, the spe specific conditions of place and time. Uh, second, uh, the previous action, uh, all that has happened before the action begins. And third, polar attitudes. Uh, these are points of view towards the environment held by the principal characters. Um, those attitudes that change over, over, over time throughout the play. Um, when we see uh, or view a play, we can ascertain usually only a very small amount about the given circumstances from what we see visually on the stage. Almost everything we learn about given circumstances come directly from the playwright's words, the dialogue. Um, given circumstances are a matter of feelings about objects and places, about time and what has happened before the play begins, and about the feelings of the characters for the special world of the play. All this the playwright through dialogue communicates to the audience. Remember now, we're thinking of this as the foundation, right? And everything that happens in the play will be based upon these given circumstances. When we talk about the three areas of given circumstances, you'll see that the first two environmental facts and previous actions, uh, previous actions are pretty straightforward and factual. You'll, and you'll notice that the third, uh, less concrete component, polar attitudes, um, that's the thing that really sets up the beginning of the play. Um, it's the attitudes of the characters towards the previous actions and their environment that really gets the drama rolling, that really um, usually leads to the inciting incident that pushes us forward in the play. All right, so we're just going to look now more in depth at these three um, areas of given circumstances. First, the environmental facts. These are pretty straightforward, kind of factual information. Um, all plays establish the environment, the time and place of the action. Um, sometimes they're historically accurate and sometimes they're made up and fantastical. Um, but in almost all cases, even if the play moves around the globe or jumps around in time, uh, they can be clearly located and defined. And when we look at the environmental facts of vital play, the time and the place, we can think about six different areas. First, the geographical location. Pretty easy, right? It's where the play happens. It includes not only the specific place, but also the conditions. The weather, for example, uh, maybe think of the Tempest, this great storm uh, in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. Uh, weather can play a huge part in a play. Um, the date, the year, the season, the time of day. Um, does the play take place in a few hours or over many years? Um, what are the rules of time in a play? Um, I think of Harold Pinter's play Betrayal, that every scene moves backward in time. Um, you know, does the play move, jump around uh, in time, or does it follow a linear path? Does time move forward? Um, you know, in some plays it moves backwards. Um, that all falls under date and time. 
uh, the economic environment, the class level of the characters, the state of wealth or poverty. Often the conflict in a play is set up um, by class or economic um, confrontations. Um, the political environment, um, often overlooked but hugely important. We can think uh, of this as the relationship between characters and the specific form of government under which they are governed. Um, sometimes this is established very clearly and sometimes it's more subtle. The social environment. Uh, this social environment is the mores and social institutions under which the characters live. Um, you know, they are very extremely important because they may restrict or often less often support uh, the behavior of the characters. Very often it's the social environment is the, what sets up some of the basic conflicts um, in a play. You know, you could very easily think of tons of examples where you, you have a play starts off um, where you have a protagonist that is just, you know, constrained by their social environment and the story of the play is really them running through that or bursting through that. The sixth element, um, I shouldn't say element, the sixth part of environmental facts is the religious environment. The religious environment includes formal and informal psychological controls. Um, it's also closely related with both the political and social environments. Um, like I said, these environmental facts are pretty straightforward. Um, and you can take, um, you know, almost any play and quickly, um, usually pretty quickly, delineate these six elements in that play. Um, we don't, often we kind of overlook these things. We don't think they're very important, but these environmental factors are what really, really create uh, the world of the play, right? Every every play has a different world, a different environment. Um, when the lights come up, come up uh, on the on the blank stage, you know we're, we're in a completely new world, and it's really these elements that we don't think about a lot um, that create that environment. Okay, so the second part under given circumstances is what we call previous action. Very simply, um, previous action is everything that has happened in the lives of the characters or in the world that affects them before the play begins. Um, present action is what we see on the stage, and the past action is everything that's happened before. Um, all the plays begin in the middle of something, right? And, and you know, unless you're, even if, if if the play starts out with the birth of the protagonist, right? Something happened before that to lead to the birth, you know, the parents meeting or whatever. So all plays really begin in the middle of something, and then very often that they begin towards the end of a specific series of events. Um, rather than the beginning. And it's how the playwright handles getting past all the action narrated into the story is very tricky business. It's called exposition or expository information. It's how playwrights get all the stuff that happened before the play started uh, into the play. Um, a good playwright will make this narration uh, exciting by giving characters in the present action in the process of recalling it. Um, that is, uh, he'll arrange for the recounting to do something to a character we are watching. It's how this previous action changes or affects the character in the present moment that's really important. Uh, here I've just put a really quick outline of kind of the major events in Hamlet. And I think I didn't put that many. I put three or four. But you can see that, 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 that it's these previous actions that happen. Hamlet's father um, getting murdered, Claudius marrying Gertrude, and this feud with Denmark and Norway really uh, begins the action of the play that leads to all these other things happening happening previous action okay the third part of the given circumstances is polar attitudes um, just like in real life all characters in a play are conditioned by the special world that they're caught in the world of their own prejudices uh, tolerance intolerances and assumptions when they are forced to have relationships with others and must take actions affecting themselves and others. The special world of a character is conditioned, of course, by environmental facts and previous actions, um, but it's really how they feel about these things or their own personal hang-ups about them that are the most important. So if we look at all the environmental factors, we look at the previous action, it's the character's attitudes towards those that is um, most important for us. Um, or for the, taking these blocks and starting to build a play. Uh, these 
polar attitudes are what set up the inner environment of the play, uh, the emotional journey, and the character arc. Um, if you think about all the pressures created by the environmental factors, social, political, religious pressures, or the past actions, uh, sins of the father, or old relationships that come back to confront a character and create the drama, um, one great way to think about it is that like the character is caught up in this special world created by the given circumstances, and the play is the way he or she is either destroyed or escapes from it. Uh, in the course of a play, a principal character does not change in character very often, uh, so much as that it's his or her attitudes uh, that change uh, from pressures outside forces uh, that are outside of his or her control. As a principal character meets these forces, uh, they have to adjust to them, and as he does, certain capabilities dormant within him, you know, the true character, whether positive or negative, come out to the surface and force them to act. Um, the capabilities that have been with him the whole time, but he has never been forced to call them up. Um, it's the old Wizard of Oz thing, right? Um, you know, Dorothy finds at the end that she's had the power to go home this entire time, but she had to go through this journey to learn that. The development in a play's action is composed of changing attitudes in the principal character towards his or her environment, towards their special world, as, as it was declared at the beginning of the play. In most plays, the attitudes of the principal characters shift radically from positions they held at the beginning um, to the way they feel at the end. This is the primary basis of what we call the character arc. And one, another way to think about it in a simple kind of form is that uh, a character arc in most plays, a character moves from a state of ignorance to a state of knowledge. Uh, he sees the world in which he lives much more clearly after the actions he has been forced to take during the course of the play than he did before. And everything that happens along this character arc between these two poles is the dramatic action. Uh, the dramatic action, we're going to, two units from now, have a whole unit on that. Uh, so when you hear the term "give them circumstances," um, we tend to think about you know very simply, oh, give them circumstances. And that's just where the play happens and what happened before. But what I want you to realize and think about is that when we see plays, that the given circumstances and the way a character feels and reacts to them is really the foundation, the bedrock of all drama. A character comes into this special world at this special time, and he is forced to confront his environment, his circumstances, and his past. And by the end of the play, he or she rises up and changes and is reborn, or they're crushed and destroyed by them. Um, and that's the basis for all drama. That's what gets us started, these given circumstances. Um, you can see here I've added two very short little uh, character arcs, very different. One of Macbeth um, starts out very ambitious, goes through the play, um, and you kind of see where he ends up there with the opposite of ambition. And... Also, with Cinderella kind of taking the opposite approach, um, starts off in a miserable situation, um, ends up in a, uh, here on this chart says a static um, situation where she lives great and everything lives happily ever after. Um, so that's it for polar attitudes, for given circumstances. Um, and that's it for this week's lecture. Um, that's all. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. Um, can't wait to see you guys at the theater. Talk to you soon. Bye.